violas are one of my favorite little flowers and I'm really surprised as I started working on this that I had not ever put one on a pattern before. But here we are and I'm really enjoying stitching this one so I'm glad I put it on this pattern. So to stitch the petals of this viola we are going to use just some classic thread painting. Sometimes I refer to it as needle painting, sometimes thread painting. And just to give you a very brief kind of basic definition of needle painting, sometimes it's called long and short stitch, and um, which is true. It uses different lengths of stitches. And, uh, you know, some thread painting is very specific about how long each stitch is and exactly where they go. Uh, my thread painting is a little more organic, I guess you could say. Um, and, but it's basically rows or sections of stitches that are different lengths, so the ends are staggered, and you are blending one color into another. Sometimes the colors are very similar to each other, like in this, you know, yellow and then this kind of more orange yellow and the dark purple and the light purple, sometimes you can blend really radically different colors together and it looks really neat. But here we're going for kind of just a very more subtle blending. Um, but don't be intimidated by it and uh, you know it's really fun. I love it because it's so much fun to see the colors as they blend together and it just takes a little bit of patience because we're going to be using one strand of thread. So before we can use the one strand, we I am going to have you stitch around the edge of each petal shape. And what that does is, this is the same for satin stitching or needle painting, you don't have to do this, but it gives it a very nice kind of a raised rounded edge. It also gives you a very clear spot about where to uh, bring your needle up. So, but mostly it just gives a really neat, sort of a little bit of a three dimensional effect on that edge. So to achieve that, I have used three strands of whatever color is the outside edge of the petal. So three strands of that color of thread, and I have done a split back stitch. This stitch is going to be covered. You could do a stem stitch or just a regular back stitch. I just like the slip split back stitch because it's quick and it, it's pretty compact, and um, I just find it very, very handy for this purpose. Now, to start the thread painting, as I said, I'm using one strand. You can use more strands and it will be chunkier. That's not necessarily wrong, but I have found the more I do it, it is easier to get a more subtle, uh, delicate blending of colors when you only use one strand. And uh, you're, you might be thinking, oh my goodness, this is gonna take forever, one strand, I don't wanna do that, it's gonna be so tedious. And when I first started using one strand, I thought the same thing, but it's really not. And in fact, I, I find that it's really easier to fill in the gaps when you're trying to, you know, cover the fabric. It's easier to find the correct place for one strand of thread versus two strands. In fact, I even started out, I did a petal with two strands just to see if I could make it go a little faster. It was just not working well. It was just not being smooth and pretty. So one strand it is, all right? So I know that I'm going to have the outside edge of this petal be one color and this sort of inside section be a second color and everything's going to work in sort of radiating stitches that go around the edge of this petal. So here I am with my one strand and I'm going to start by just laying in some stitches. I'm coming up outside that split back stitch and I'm going to head back towards the center and this is going to help me as I go around and fill in it's going to help me determine the angle since I'm not going across in a straight you know a, like a, a straight row or a column since it's around this arc this curved petal so I'm making sure I come up really close to this split back stitch and I'm making very long stitches because even though I know that I want, let's see if I can get a, oh, there's one disappearing marker to show, even though I know that I want um, 
my that darker color to fill in along about in here. I am going to make sure that I take this color, this first color, and I take those stitches all the way into the section that's going to be the darker color. So I don't want to come, I don't want to be real rigid about where I take my stitches down all the way around that, that like that line. I want to go into that section and you can see how I've got a long stitch and a shorter stitch and a much longer and a kind of a short one. Just very random. And those are pretty long stitches, but this is not too big of an area. Sometimes with thread painting, even if you're using the same color, you can do, you know, shorter stitches and do more than one row. I, I almost hate to use the term row because that seems so rigid and it's, it's not rows really, but um, sections maybe. But so now I have gone all the way around and I've got all these different lengths of stitches and that shows me, that tells me that I'm going to be working around. That just sort of gives me a guide. So now what I want to do is go in and start filling in between all of these random stitches. And I just go back and forth I try hard not to put two stitches, make the length of two stitches exactly the same right next to each other. And I'm just going to go back and forth, jump around. You don't have to work rigidly from right to left or left to right on this. Oops. And I don't want to have, I don't want to make like super short stitches. Like I wouldn't really want to do that because I want this whole area to be filled in. So I'm, even if I don't go into the section that's going to be dark, I want to make those stitches, still want to make those stitches pretty long. And it's important for this first section as you are working from the outside in that you cover this area, all of this whole first section, completely with your stitches. Even though we're working with one strand, it can be done. You just have to keep adding stitches. And you just don't want to skimp. You don't want to have any of that gray fabric showing through. You just want to keep stitching until every bit of fabric is covered and you don't see any little spaces between stitches. And as you get more filled in, sometimes you kind of have to hunt for those spaces. But if you just keep building up your stitches, you'll start to see where you have a need to put a stitch. Now a trick that I use all the time, especially as I fill in more and more and it's a little bit harder to see where to put the needle down, I will take this, I've come up and I want to know where to go down, so I will take this thread and I will lay it down trying to decide where to put that needle down. And you don't want to like make crazy different angles, like that's way different from the angles that are already there. I want to keep in line with the angles that I've already started. So I, I'm just going to lay that one down and say, okay, that's where, that's where to put the needle down to make that stitch, put, have that stitch lay down in the right place. And occasionally, you know, I will get a stitch in a, I'll put the needle down kind of in a wonky place and get a weird angle across there and I generally try to take those out and correct the angle of my stitch. I mean you can sometimes you can keep going and cover it up but if you if you've got kind of a large area like this and you want it to really be smooth and satiny it, it pays to pay some attention to the angle and where the stitches fit in between each other. You just don't want to have them cross over each other a whole lot. Now, obviously, down here at this end where they're all clumped together a little bit more, you know, they're going to be 
a little bit on top of each other and but generally you want the angles to stay consistent. So even though I'm using one strand, it's not taking that long to get this section filled up. I'm always making sure that I am doing different lengths. So I'm never, I don't want a hard line where a bunch of stitches have all been the same length and thus, you know, create a, a, a hard edge. And I am working on this one with the outside edge facing me this way. And I'm working away from myself. N normally, it doesn't really matter, whichever you're most comfortable with. Normally, I tend to work with it flipped around the other way so that I am uh, pulling this, you know, I'm coming up here and going down towards me. So, you know, the pedal would be flipped around. So the outside edge would be facing that way. But this one, it's right up near the edge and it was too hard to get it. I was in my hoop stand and I was just working right up against the, the, the clamp part of it and it was just not it's just easier to have it away and out like this. So I, on this one, I'm working, I'm working away from myself. But like I said, it that's really, honestly, just kind of more what you're comfortable with. Hmm, I might take that one out. I wasn't talking, and I wasn't paying quite enough attention to exactly where that one went down. So let me quickly re-thread my needle. So now as I'm getting it more filled in is where it becomes a little bit more critical, a little bit more helpful to take that thread and lay it down and figure out, you know, do I want to put the needle there or do I want that stitch to angle this way? No, do I want it? No. There's a little slot right there. See that little, I don't know if you can see it hopefully, but that little gray area that's still showing through. If I lay it down, that one thread will fill it in. It's amazing how it seems like one thread is not going to do much, but if you put it in just the right spot, it absolutely fills in a space that was there. So I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to make sure that I don't stop too soon. That one has a little shadow right there, a little gap. This guy has a gap right there. I'm going to make sure that I don't stop too soon so that this section is not too thin. And because I'm going to be coming back and adding a second color, working a second color up into it, it just needs to be as full as it can be because you're going to be covering up a little bit of this color when you add the second color. I know that didn't really make a lot of sense, but if you when you come back with the second color and you're if it's um, too sparse if the stitches are too sparse and there's just spaces in between um, you just don't get that really pretty blending I think I have one can you see that right there there's like one gap right there let me see if I can figure out where to bring my needle up sometimes it takes just a second and if I lay that thread down, get my hand out of the way, I think maybe right there we'll fill it in. All right, so I think another trick that I will sometimes do is I will take it off of my hoop stand and I will turn it around and face different directions so the light's hitting it in different directions because it could be that from from this direction with the light hitting it the way I have it now, it looks like it's filled in. But if I were to turn it, you know, a little bit, quarter turn, I might see an area that was, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to bump that. I might see an area that was um, just not, you know, I just would have missed a, a little spot there. But I think that's got it. So I'm going to go get my next color of thread. I now have one strand of the slightly darker purple on my needle. And now comes the really fun part where you get to start blending the two colors. And so uh, in order to 
really keep this nice and satiny smooth you're going to come up inside the stitches that you already made and see how far I came way way up in there I don't want to I don't want to just like fill in stitches right here because that will just give me more like a, a purple dot I want blended color so if I don't come up amongst these lighter purple stitches I'm not going to get the blending of light and dark purple so I'm going to come for this first stitch I'm going to come way up inside the light purple and go down all the way to here and the same principle applies I'm going to go around make some sort of guideline stitches different lengths same thing I don't want stitches that are where the ends of the stitches all line up because that'll be, that'll be a hard line and I don't want a hard line I want a soft staggered edge of stitches so now I've laid in my first stitches but obviously I still have some some spaces down in there and so as I go around I'm just gonna make sure that I again different lengths come up in the stitches that I already made and when I first started doing needle painting in fact I have a couple of videos that I where I talk about this I used to I used to come up in the unstitched area and take my needle down in the stitched area and I don't do that anymore because when you when you take the needle and thread down it leaves a little like a little um, hole like a little divot or something and since we're trying to get very smooth blending of color you don't want a little a little mark there you'd think that coming up inside the stitches and at first it kind of like see how it sort of seems like it's separating those threads but that's another reason that using one strand is helpful because when you come up with just one strand you don't break those stitches you've already made too much you don't you know leave a, a big hole there and that one strand can lay down very smoothly it can you know the stitches can meld together and this section does not take as long because you're just not putting quite as many stitches in of course but I do want to make sure that I get it dark enough so it shows up but I just always 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 want to make sure that I am getting different lengths of stitches and I'm pretty close to done I believe and I don't know one more right there I think maybe and then just like in satin stitching you can take your finger or your fingernail and you can kind of you know run them over the stitches and that kind of helps them to sort of mush together a little bit and I think I feel like maybe one more I feel like this petal with this one stitch okay I feel like that is done the leaf for this viola is uh, also thread painted and it's very similar to the petals in that we're going to uh, each side has two colors on it and using one strand of thread but there's a couple of differences here the uh, main one or one of the big ones is that there is no I did not stitch an outline to stitch over and the reason I didn't is because I am going to have a decorative stitch around this outline that's going to cover that outline anyway so it didn't really need a uh, you know a raised edge on it like like the petals had up here so and you know you're not even gonna see this edge along here because it's gonna be covered up with stitching so there's no reason to do an outline and the other big difference is the angle whereas the petals all went sort of in a radiating uh, angles around the center the angles on the leaf all g work from the top of the leaf angled towards the bottom towards the center 
and then all towards the, the center and then towards the bottom. So it's really just kind of more along the edge and slightly curving around. But, um, you know, if you want to take a pen and draw a little guideline uh, b beforehand, sometimes at first these angles kind of gave me a little bit of, they're a little bit tricky at first because I had to sort of figure out how much to angle them as they went around. And so, but it's really not a, not a strong angle. So um, if you can just see the ones here, um, really they just kind of go from the outside edge towards the center vein and then just work your way around a little bit. So I've already done this half, of course, and I've already done the, uh, the dark green on this side, the first color. And um, I, admit I talked about on the petal how I was working it flipped um, so that I was working away from myself well, because of where it was on the hoop and I couldn't really get to it. But now this is out in the center, so I can, now I can start to work towards me. So what I mean by that is I can bring my needle up. This is the second color, one strand again. I can bring my needle up and I can bring the stitch towards me and go down, pulling the thread towards me. But it's the same thing I did before. I'm just going to lay in some of these stitches. Coming up inside the stitching, I already made the dark green. And this helps me just get a, uh, a good feel for the angles again. Make sure I come way up inside that dark green so the colors blend really well. Make a short one. In some ways the angles on this leaf were a little bit, gave me a little bit more, made me work for it a little bit more than the petals did because the petal, the angles on the petals are really obvious. Just work around the edge towards the center. And on this leaf, they're a little bit different, like how much to curve, whatever, whatever angles you end up doing, just, you know, be consistent so that you're not having like crisscross stitches so that they all stay smooth like this. So in other words, if you had one, a stitch, if you, if your angles started here and worked and you went like this around the bottom, that's fine. Mine stayed like this, but if you ended up going like this, that's fine. Just keep them consistent so that they all lay smoothly. So now I just fill in all those spaces. This part is literally just like the petal. One strand of thread. There's a fuzz on there. leaves go a little bit faster because you do not have to put the outline and you don't even have to be quite as careful about the outline because like I said it's going to be covered up so if it's not perfect then it's fine. So that's all there is to the leaf. It's just two colors, just sort of like the petals, two colors within each shape. And so each side of the leaf is, you know, like a shape. So I will finish this side of the leaf up and we can work on the edges. Viola leaves have a little scalloped edge on them and that is what we are going to recreate by using a combination of two different stitches, the chain stitch and the buttonhole stitch. So let me show you how to do that. So the chain stitch is a very basic stitch. There are two ways to do it. There's the traditional way, I call it the, the traditional way, and the reverse chain stitch. I, lots of people love reverse chain stitch and I am not one of those people that has really learned to love it. Um, so I just do it the traditional way. So you, let me show you that again, you come up, you hold a loop and you come up inside that loop. And then now I have come up, I'm going to go back down right where I came up, keep a loop open, 
and come up inside that loop. So that's the basic chain stitch. Now for this, for our purposes, it matters both how long the stitch is and how loose the stitch is. Sometimes, you know, depending on what you're wanting, you can leave the stitches really loose and get a very, um, you know, teardrop shape. You can pull them tighter and have a much straighter shape. We're working in kind of a small area, so I do want them to be pretty tight. I mean, don't pull them so hard that you, you know, stretch the fabric out of alignment. And uh, the ones I'm, I've just done here are a little bit long for our purposes. So I normally when I do chain stitch, I do it whether I'm doing an outline or a filling stitch, I make them really small. Well, I don't want them too small for this because we're going to be working inside each loop or each chain. But I don't want them too long. So the ones on the leaf, you know, are maybe they're not as long as a quarter of an inch and they're longer than an eighth of an inch. So whatever that is. So I'm going to make one here that's about the length of the stitch we are going to be working on on the leaf. So you can see how that one's a little bit shorter. Let me do one more of those. And as I work on the leaf, some of them are longer and as I work towards the tip of the leaf, I make them shorter like because they would be smaller scallops towards the tip and that's fine. All right, so there's the chain stitch. Now we are going to be working inside each of these loops. So now we're going to do the blanket stitch and so I've left this one pretty loose. It's a little too loose for my purposes and a little too long, but it, it helps because it, it's easy for you to see what I'm talking about. So there's a little left arm right there. Now I'm right-handed and so I these I, I work this way. Actually I'm going to work from the top down now that I mention it. I'm going to start up here. Um, actually no, I'm going to start here. I'm going to show you and then I'm going to work in the direction that I like to work. So let me just start here just for demonstration. Okay, so I'm right-handed and the scallop is going to be on the left-hand side because I'm going to be working like this. If you're left-handed you can switch it but just know which side you want the scallop to be on. All right, so here it is. I'm going to come up inside the stitch like that. Now I'm coming up. I'm using two strands, by the way, which is what I'm going to be using on the, uh, the leaf. I'm going to move my needle minder. It's a little bit in the way right there. All right, so now to do the buttonhole. Oh, you know what? Forget that. I work towards me, not away from me. So let's say, just pretend like these are not there and I'm going to work in, in this chain stitch. I'm going to start at the top of the stitch, okay? And I'm going to come up inside with the left arm on the left like that. All right, so now I'm going to keep this thread looped like that because I'm going to go underneath this left arm of the chain and I'm going to go on top of that thread. And I'm going to pull it through and pull it so it's snug. I'll do that again. I'm going to keep this thread, hold it like that, go under the arm, go on top of that thread, and pull it snug against that left arm. Now, when you pull it, you don't want to pull it super hard because you can pull you can pull them too small. First of all, you won't really be able to see the little the little blanket stitches, and you're going to pull that chain stitch way out of alignment. So that's one reason you don't want your chain stitches to be super loose because you don't want a big gap right there. So you know, pull it so that it's snugged up against this thread, but don't pull it so tight that it's just pulled into oblivion. So when I pull it like this, I pull it gently. I'm kind of holding it up so it's pushed up next to that stitch and I just pull it till it just stops. You can, if you come down here, you can take your needle and you can sort of push it till it sits next to the stitch that you just made. All right, so that's my comparison that's not so great. So I'm just going to go down. So let's pretend like we're doing the actual the actual thing. So we're going to start up here at the top. This is one of my smaller ones, which is about the length, roughly the length of the ones that are on the leaf. I'm going to come up inside that loop. All right. 
pull the thread to the left, go underneath the arm, go over my thread on the left and pull it. And how long your chain stitches are will determine how many blanket stitches you do. So on that one, it's pretty small. So I, I just did three. They're all lined up close together, but not just crammed up next to each other. So to end this one, I am going to go down, take the needle down. I don't want to go down inside the loop because that causes the scallop to kind of flip over. And I want it to lay flat. So, and I want it to have a nice, you know, point on the end where it actually ends. So I'm going to take the needle behind, right where those two chain stitches meet each other and underneath a little bit the, the scallop that I just made. So when I pull that through, it pulls that little point down and now I have a perfect little curve right there. So let me do one more. So now I start the next one. I come up at the top of the stitch inside I go under the arm, go over that thread, make sure I'm going over that thread, pulling that stitch, that's, that's three, I think that's long enough. And I'm going to go down at the very tip of that stitch and behind it just a little bit. All right, so see how I have two cute little scallops right there. All right, so now let's go over to the actual leaf and I'll show you what how it looks over there. Before we or before you stitch the scalloped edges, go ahead and stitch the stem and the center vein. For the stem, I use 3 strands of the dark green thread and the split back stitch, and for the center vein, I used 2 strands of the dark green thread and the same split back stitch. So it's just easier to do those first and then do the scalloped edges over those. All right, so now that that's done, I've already gotten a start here. I've done this side in the, in the medium green. I'm going to do this side. I'm matching the color that's on the outside edge of the leaf here. I already have a few done. So here are my chain stitches. I'm ready to do this one. I'm going to come up inside. And if, it, if you've pulled these pretty tightly, which is good because, like I said, you don't want them to be real you know, have a big gap right there. If you're having trouble getting the needle to come up and not split those threads, what I do sometimes, I'll take like the eye of another needle and I'll kind of, yeah, I'm not left-handed, so I'm fumbling around, but I'll kind of, I'll kind of pull that chain open. This one, I don't really need to do that, but if you, if you find that you're having, if you're struggling to get, come up inside the loop, you're splitting those threads, um, just pull it apart either with your fingernail or with a, another needle. Uh, so anyway, now I've come up and I also find it helpful when I'm trying to pull, you know, put this needle under the arm of that loop to push on the back like that. If you can see what I'm doing there, because it kind of helps to push it up, especially if they're stitching right over here that you've already done and you're trying to put this put this needle through and you don't want to catch that stitching you certainly don't want to catch you know a, a thread or go down into the fabric so it helps to kind of push the back side and push that needle up but always make sure that you go over the thread on the left and I'm also holding this the right needle in my right hand really flat I'm not coming at it down I'm it's like almost flat against the fabric and that helps you to uh, get under that arm. You can switch to a blunt end needle that doesn't have a point on it, but you know, who wants to switch needles? So if you're struggling, if you're really, you know, catching other stitches or the background fabric with that sharp needle, you can flip this over and that's the eye that has a, a you know, a rounded end and you can go under your loop that way. Of course, that means you're pushing on the sharp end, so be careful. But generally though, I don't find that I really have to do that. I can, if I'm just careful, I'm gonna watch what I'm doing.
think I'm going to put four on this one because it's slightly longer. All right, so what's happening now is that something about this stitch, I think it's all of the winding around and around and around, it tends to get your thread to be very twisty. Can you see how it's twisting up on itself right there? That makes it, that makes your stitches be not lay down quite so flat and it makes knots much more common. So I'm going to go down, I'm going to finish that stitch by going kind of behind the scallop and now I am going to let my thread hang. Some stitches are worse than other stitches for this. Some stitches you never ever need to let your, what I'm doing is I'm letting the needle hang and I'm letting it spin which untwists. The, the thread has just gotten spiraled around so many times that it's all twisty. If I let it just let it hang and let the needle just go around and around until it stops spinning, then I know that the threads are untwisted. So like I said, some stitches never need to do that. Some stitches you need to do it every, and this is one of them, I find I need to do it about every, honestly, about every two or three blanket stitches. Something about that round and around, going around the arm of that loop. I think that was three. This is four. Might even do five on this one. And just, just make sure that those, hopefully you can see this, just make sure those blanket stitches are next to each other and not, you know, twisted around each other or piled on top of each other. And that's just kind of all in how, you know, how you, you stack them up on that, the arm of that loop. Just kind of arrange them before you move on to the next stitch and just make sure that you haven't pulled that loop on top of the loop that you just made. finish with that one. All right, so see all those cute little scallops? That's why I love doing this stitch. It's just, it's a really, really neat little scalloped effect. All right, so that is the combination of the chain stitch and the buttonhole stitch for a scalloped edge. The only thing left to do to finish up the petals is to stitch these darker blue lines and these are made using two strands of the navy thread. I think it's DMC 796, if I remember my numbers correctly. And it's done just like you did the needle painting, the thread painting, although even though you're using two strands, just come up in the stitched part and go down here. Just put three lines there, three lines on that one, and then five different lengths of stitches for that center petal. So those are the petals, all finished. Next thing to do is to do the center. And the first thing we want to do is to fill in this little oval right here with some color. It's going to be mostly covered up by the time we're finished, but you still need to put some color under there. So I'm using three strands of the brightest green and just a super quick um, satin stitch. I don't know what's going on there. It's like a little piece of fuzz or something. That's going to bug me. But anyway. All right, so just a really quick satin stitch. Doesn't have to be gorgeous. Like I said, it's mostly going to be covered up. Don't have to outline it or anything. It's really just to get a little bit of color under there. I guess theoretically you could leave it gray if you wanted to. That'd be fine. But anyway, so I will quickly fill in this shape with a little bit of satin stitch. Next thing to do is to put some French knots here at the bottom edge of this center. So I have three strands of DMC thread and I am going to start out with the center French knot and I want it to be the largest one. So I'm going to come up right at the bottom center and I'm going to wrap the needle four times. One, two, three, four. I'm going to go down. And that makes a pretty hefty French knot. 
that's okay. I want it to be bigger than the other two that are going to be right next to it. There's my thread on the back. There it is. Okay, I'm not going to pull too hard on it because I want it to have some bulk to it. And now I'm going to do one French knot on this side and one on this side that are both the same. This one is going to be wrapped two times. One, two. here. Place each of these on the sides a little bit higher than this one so they kind of make a curve around the bottom there. But one, two times to wrap around. Alright, those are the French knots. To finish up the flower part of this viola, are these two stitches right here, these ecru colored stitches. And I am going to be honest with you, they, these two stitches might be one of the one or two places on this hoop that frustrate you the most. It's just two stitches, but these are bullion stitches. And bullion stitches are so cool, but they are also not the simplest stitch you're ever going to do, and they require some practice. But I have made a, an entire separate video, a lengthy video, about how to create bullion stitches, just like this, as well as other, other things you can do with them. So I am, it's going to be a separate video on my YouTube channel, but for this tutorial, for this section, I am going to go ahead and also put it in here so you can just keep watching and I'm, you'll be able to see the whole tutorial. If you already know how to do bullion stitches, that's great. You can skip that whole thing if you want. You might want to watch it though because you never know. You might learn something. You just never know. But regardless, you can either just watch that video and we're going to talk about how to make these very interesting and unique bullion stitches. So I don't want to make you wait any longer. So let's get jump right into the basic how to make a bullion stitch. But keep watching after we do this because I'm going to talk a lot more in depth about how to make, if you're not successful at first, why, how different threads and all the different things can affect why you may not, you're not happy immediately with your bullion stitch. But let's get right to the basic how to. So here's my stitch length. I come up at the top. Oh, I forgot to say one thing. I, one of the most important things about bullion stitches is the needle that you use. This is called a milliner's needle. If you can see the eye, it's a little bit hard right there. This is called a milliner's needle and that is because it is one width all the way from the eye down here to the point. In other words, the shaft, the eye is not bigger. The, whole, the area around where the eye is doesn't like you know, stick out any. It's a one width all the way down. And so that makes a huge difference when you are pulling your needle through all of this thread that we're about to do. When I first started doing bullion stitches, I had heard you needed a milliner's needle and I thought, oh, you know what, that's fine. I can just do it without it. You can make bullion stitches without a milliner's needle, but trust me, it makes it so much easier and you'll be much more successful. So it is worth it. All right, basic how to. Come up at the top. Oh, one other thing I forgot to tell you. I am using for this demonstration right here at the beginning. I will do something different a little bit later. But I am using Pearl, DMC Pearl thread, the number five size. So this is a thread that is not like the stranded DMC. So you don't separate this. So it just stays in this, stays just like it is, just like the way it comes out of the skein like this. So that's what I'm using for this demonstration. All right, back to the how-to. Come up at the top. Go down at the bottom of your stitch. But keep a loop of thread. Don't pull the thread all the way through. Keep some working thread right here. And now you're going to come up at the top of the stitch right where that thread comes out of the fabric. But again, you're not going to pull the needle all the way through. Leave the needle just like that. Now comes the part where we're going to wrap the needle. So I'm going to take this working thread and I'm going to wrap it around the needle. That's what's going to give us the sort of tube 
effect of the stitch. So now I am going to wrap the purl thread one, two, three, four, five, six times. I'm going to push those wraps towards the fabric. And the way I have the needle now, it's very convenient that I can, from the back, I can manipulate it like this. I can also fold it over. Once those threads are down by the fabric, I can fold it over and see if that stitch is going to be the right length, if I have enough, enough wraps to make this stitch length correct. So to go from here to here, because I want this to be a flat stitch. We'll do curved stitches a little bit later. But that, I've already done this stitch length, so I know that that's the correct number of wraps. So now that I have that, I'll come back up and I will hold those wraps with this hand, those two fingers, and I will pull the needle and the thread through those wraps. So I'm still holding on to those wraps. Here's the part where it gets a little bit, you know, you're never quite sure if it's going to turn out. Let me pull that aside so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm going to pull that thread through. When I get to about there, I'm going to pull this thread and lay it down flat on the fabric, and I'm going to pull it towards me. I'm also going to take the tip of the needle and push those wraps, kind of keep them up at the top there. I'm going to keep pulling that thread gently, and I'm not yanking on it, but just gently until everything kind of lays flat against the fabric. Now I can take my needle and go down at the end of the stitch. And there is my first bullion stitch. So now let me do that again. my needle out at the top of the stitch, go down at the bottom of the stitch, keep some working thread, come back out at the same place where the needle, uh, the, sorry, the thread is coming out at the top of the stitch, and then now wrap the thread around the needle, push the wraps down towards the fabric. You can fold the needle over to see if your stitch length is correct. Hold those wraps with your fingers. Pull that thread through. When you get to about here, pull this thread towards you. Use the tip of the needle to keep the wraps towards the towards the top and then take the needle down at the bottom of the stitch. And one more time. Come out at the top of the stitch. Go down at the bottom of the stitch. Pull the needle through, but keep some thread, some working thread out. Bring the needle up at the top of the stitch. Wrap, the, wrap this thread around the needle. Push those wraps towards the fabric. Fold the needle over if you need to. Hold the wraps on the needle. Pull the thread through. Pull the thread towards you and use the needle to push those wraps towards the top and then put the needle down at the bottom of the stitch. Now let's look at some different things that will affect how these bullion stitches look. One of the things that can have the biggest impact on what your stitch looks like is the direction in which you wrap the thread around the needle. And that is because every thread has a direction of its twist. Some threads are S twist and some are Z twist. And to be perfectly honest, I can never remember which thread is which direction. If I need that information, I have to go look it up somewhere. So we're, again, using the purl thread. And I, like I said, I think maybe this is a, an S twist, perhaps. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But so far, we have done these three stitches by wrapping the thread counterclockwise around the needle. Let's do some stitches where we wrap it the other direction. So here we are, everything's the same so far, but now instead of wrapping it 
this way, as we did before, we are going to wrap it this direction because clocks, you know, go around this way. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Push those wraps down. I can fold it over. It looks like that's still a good uh, length, number of wraps. Pull the thread through and push that, push those wraps up. Let me do it one more time, wrapping clockwise. So go clockwise. One, two, three, four, five, six. really kind of not great. So looking at these, these three were clock uh, counterclockwise, these two were clockwise, and it's a little bit hard to see a, a huge difference when you're using the purl thread, but I know, I can tell that these three just retain the quality of their wraps a little bit better. They're more defined. These look a little bit um, messier because what happens is the wrap, the thread becomes a little bit unwrapped, which when you're using a purl thread like this, it doesn't come unwrapped quite like it does on a, like a DMC stranded thread, which I'll show you a little bit later. But I, I can just tell that these just keep their form better. These just look messier. So I know from doing this that I, if, if I really wanted to, I mean, you might want that look, but I just prefer the way these look. So when I use purl thread, I like to wrap my thread clock, sorry, counterclockwise around the needle. One really neat thing about bullion stitches is that you can change the look of it depending on how many wraps you make. So we've already done these, which we know are flat. We know that it takes six wraps to go from here to here to make a flat stitch. But if I wanted to make a stitch that is curved, like would curve up above the fabric, all I need to do is add more wraps. So up at the top, down at the bottom, come up, up the where the thread comes out. And now I'm going to wrap, but I'm not going to wrap six times. I'm going to wrap, oh, let's do nine or ten. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six, seven, eight, let's do nine, and let's just do 10. So it'll be really curved. So if I fold it over, you can see that that is too many wraps to make that a flat stitch. But what is gonna happen if I pull it through and as you get more wraps, that's where that milliner's needle becomes really even more important because if you put, you know, you can do a bullion stitch that has 20 wraps on it. And if you're trying to pull a needle that has a big eye through that, it's much harder. So anyway, so now I've pulled my thread through. So now when I pull on this, it's not gonna lay flat, it will Take the needle down. Now it will curve. So I can, if I wanted to make a rose, I could push it over to the side. You know, if you wanted it to, you know, be raised this way, that could be interesting. We could go over to that side. So the, the more wraps, the more curved it's going to be. You can even, you can, you know, if let's say your stitch was like from here to here, like this little bitty tiny, you could come up here go down here, come back up, and you could put 15 wraps and it can make a complete, like a loop, you know, more like a, like a daisy stitch, sort of looks like a daisy stitch, but made out of wraps. So that is how to make a curved stitch or a raised curved stitch versus a flat stitch. Since we are talking about what it looks like in different types of thread, let's try some DMC stranded thread. 
This is just the regular six-stranded thread. It's all six strands. I have not stripped it or separated it or in any way. I just using I'm using it just exactly the way it comes off of the skein. I am still using the same exact needle as before, the milliner's needle. So let's start out doing let's go let's see. Let's go clockwise with this thread. back there to get kind of hard to get that needle up in the same spot hang on let me just take a second to all right so all right now I'm at the top I've come out at the top so let's go clockwise I think I said so let's try we knew with the pearl thread it was six wraps one two three four five six let's see if it's the same and it appears that if I go clockwise it is the same. That's a good fit for that stitch to fill that stitch in so it's flat. So I'm going to pull that through. And oh, I was pretty lucky. That one turned out pretty good. I do find that the DMC is a little bit more, it's a little trickier to work with because the strands are can separate a little bit on you as you're Pulling, you know, sometimes I get uh, like one little strand that doesn't want to, you know, behave with the rest. It doesn't, so they doesn't kind of want to stick together or something. So I do find it a little bit harder to use than the pearl. The pearl thread just seems to sort of stick together better and play nicely. But so anyway, that was the clockwise. Let me do one more clockwise. And I like the look of that. go clockwise again. Also a hint when you're doing not so much if you're just doing one, one or two stitches but when I'm doing repeated stitches all in a row this is one of those stitches where it really pays to let your needle hang and let the thread untwist because all this twisting and wrapping you're doing the, the thread can get sort of twisted up and it'll start to do that a lot and it's can kind of not up on itself. So that's something to keep in mind, but all right, clockwise. One, two, three, four, five, six. Check my needle length. So you know, I maybe I made those dots a little bit further apart. So can you see that? How that I could maybe get one more wrap in there to make that. So I'm just gonna make this one seven. Check it again. That seems good really just more a function of the dots being a little bit further apart on that one. So that looks pretty good. Now let's try counterclockwise. Just as before, I'll come up at the top, down at the bottom, leave some working thread, come back up at the top, leave my needle partway through. Now I'm going to go counterclockwise. Two, three, four, five, six. And right away you can see a difference. If I fold that needle over, you can see how long suddenly all those wraps make that stitch look. It's like too long for this stitch length. Six wraps before, notwithstanding that last one, all of these others, it's taken six wraps. Now it's way too long. And the reason for that is because as I was wrapping counterclockwise that thread was getting flattened out. So do you see right there how it looks more like a, ri a flat ribbon now as opposed to a ropey twist? That's what happens when I wrap DMC stranded thread counterclockwise. So that's too many wraps. So let me back up. Well let me just do it again because I can't remember. One, two, three, let's see if four wraps is enough. Four wraps is probably going to be okay. So let me try four. Pull that through. And here is one of the reasons why I find DMC a little tricky to use. See that little, see how that went down there? Just did not get quite as tight. Kind of a little weird down there. But anyway. Okay, so this one. 
on the DMC over here where we wrapped clockwise, you can see more defined wraps. On this one, it kind of flattens out. It looks like you've wrapped a bunch of thread a whole lot, but we only we actually did fewer wraps here. Let me do it one more time. Clockwise. One, two, three, four. Is that the same? Yeah, four wraps works. And I still got a little bit of that strangeness at the bottom. But so take a look at these two. These two, the DMC, was one direction. These two were the other direction. So this is not necessarily wrong. It just depends on what look you want. If you want the more defined uh, differentiation between the wraps, choose this direction. If you want it to look more smooth and like it's finer thread because it gets flattened out, as you go counterclockwise, choose this one. It really is a function of just practicing it first and deciding what you want and knowing whether you're using pearl thread or DMC or yarn or silk thread or whatever kind of yarn or thread you are using, do a test first and decide which direction you want to make the wrap so that you know how your stitch is going to look when you make it on your piece. I am going to talk for just a moment about practice. And the bullion stitch is definitely one of those stitches that you will need to and want to practice. Some stitches, you know, you can just look at someone, look at a video tutorial, watch them do one or two stitches, and you can do it yourself. Or you can look at a diagram, and it's easy to figure out how to do it, and it comes out great the second time you do it. The bullion stitch is not one of those stitches. It is definitely a stitch that needs practice. And I'm going to show you my chaotic practice hoop. I always keep a hoop of fabric nearby so that I, it has, it's an 8-inch hoop. Has, I just put white fabric in it. It has lots of space so I can just randomly do all kinds of stitches. I can test out threads and uh, styles and stitches and all sorts of things. But I think you can see on here all of the bullion. Uh, more than anything else, I've practiced the bullion stitch. And I've tried different threads and I've tried, you know, I'm figuring out the length of the stitch and how many wraps it takes and which kind of thread works best and which direction to go clockwise, counterclockwise, all those kinds of things. You can see, um, like, here's, like, all of these, just one right after another. Practice, practice, practice. These up here, figuring out length. These up here, figuring out direction. I made notes to myself. Counterclockwise, five. Five wraps, and counterclockwise. Um, this one up here, I was practicing the, like, the viola that I showed you earlier. Like, how many wraps to make it just slightly curved. So, the point being that it is worth practicing. Every time I do particularly bullion stitch, I always practice a bunch of times. And before I started this video, I did, you know, 25 of these before I, I started this video just so I could warm up that hand-brain-eye connection so that it, it settles in and I know what I'm doing. And um, you'll, just be, you'll just be happier when you do this stitch, practice it, and... I promise it's just don't get discouraged if you make three stitches and they all look bad don't get discouraged keep practicing because I've done 10 stitches in a row when every single one looked bad like look at these none of these look like that one was good and then it went back to looking bad and same down here see these you know bad bad too thin not enough wraps that one that one was good and then I went back to not so great two and then that one was good and then those kind of iffy whatever don't get discouraged if it's not you know beautiful the second stitch you do keep working at it I promise you'll get it and it will it will look good and it'll be worth it now let's talk about some things that can go wrong and why and you know one of the most common issues you might have is not putting enough wraps and um, it'll just you know you'll have like some thread showing underneath and that's obvious did that like like I mentioned, practicing. If you do a bunch of stitches of the exact length you know you're going to want, you can figure out how many wraps you're going to need. But let's do some other things that, talk about some other things that could go wrong. So here I am. I know it takes six, six wraps to make a flat stitch. And I know that the counterclockwise looks best. 
But now I am going to, I'm going to make just, I'm not going to be real careful about how tight my wraps are, how even, not, not about tightness so much, but how even they are. So that's one, two, three, oh, let me go back. One, two, three, four, five. Ha, hang on. All right, here we go again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so I have not been careful about how the sa how each wrap is the same tension. I am also not going to be careful about the fact that I'm going to let those wraps kind of uh, twist on top of each other. Can you see that right there? Like it's pulling back that way. See how that one is laying on top as opposed to being lined up. All right, so I'm going to let the wraps be too loose. I'm going to twist over it. I'm not going to push them together neatly, but I'm going to hold it. We're going to just see. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. So I pulled through, and now I have a mess. So see, I, even if I try, well, you know what? It kind of came together, but it's not very even. All right, that was pure luck. It could have been a disaster. But it is loose, and it's not even. I can keep pulling on it and it's just you know that's you're like playing with fire right there it's really better when you're wrapping that needle to make sure that the tension is the same for each wrap and that they are lined up they're stacked up so they're not twisted on top of each other let's do something else you know that one ended up uh, I mean who knows maybe you want it to look kind of organic like that but Let's do one that is really, really tight. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I, have, I am really, really choking up on those wraps. They are crazy tight. I'm gonna push them down, but they are tight. One thing about tight stitches is that even though you can maybe see that even though I wrapped it six, it's not quite, maybe not gonna fill that, but it is super tight. And even with this milliner's needle, I'm going to have trouble pulling it through, but I did it. So now when I pull, see how, I mean, again, not horrible, but it's pretty thin. If I had done that with a DMC stranded thread, it would look, it would just kind of not look good at all. It wouldn't have any plumpness to it. Um, let's see what it looks like with not enough wraps. So I know six is the right number. One, two, three. Let's do three. All right. Doesn't cover. It just looks like, obviously, it's just not going to cover it. There's something else that can happen. It's kind of a delicate balance, sort of a dance between how hard you, how much you tug on that thread two, three, four, five, six. Push the wraps down. Okay, it's kind of a delicate balance between right here. This is kind of a critical spot right here. If you, like I mentioned, I like to pull it towards me and pull this thread this way towards me. If I just pull without uh, using the tip of my needle to push those up, it doesn't form up. It's too loose up here and it's strange down there, okay? So that's why you do want to push those wraps up. But if I pull too hard, I also, you know, those just, they don't even exist anymore. The wraps are just so choked up on that thread, it doesn't really look like much. And it's too tight up there and it's strange down here. So don't, you know, pull it, pull on it a little bit when you get to the bottom so that those, everything kind of forms up. But don't pull so hard that you just obliterate the entire stitch. I want to talk briefly about the stab method versus the sewing method for bullion stitches. And the stab method is what I use for 99.9% .9 of all of my stitching. But if you look 
uh, at a lot of the tutorials for bullion stitch, many of them will show you the, sew, the sewing method. And let me show you what I'm talking about. So you start out just the same, but here's where it gets different. If you are doing the sewing method, you put your needle down into the fabric and you come up like that. And that's the sewing method. I don't really care for this method because I keep my fabric so tight in the hoop that it's a little bit tricky for me to do that. If you're going to do that with bullion stitches, it's fine. It works great if that's more comfortable for you and works better for you and if your stitches turn out better for you this way, definitely do it this way. So if you wanted to do the sewing method, you're going to hold, uh, put your needle through like that. Move it down a little bit. And all those other stitches are in the way. And then you can sort of, you can push it up. See, I'm not very good at this method because I never do it. And you can sort of angle that needle up like that and then you can wrap your thread like that. You can even put a finger under it to hold those wraps like that. All right. Can you see that? And then it's the same thing. You would hold these wraps and pull the needle through. So you end up in the same exact place. You just make one motion for the needle instead of an, you know, all the way down and then halfway up from the back. If that doesn't make much sense, I know. But um, I, like I said, because my fabric is so tight, I am more fluid. I feel like it's easier for me to do the stab method. So you come all the way up, go all the way down, but keep the thread, and then you push the needle up halfway. This also gives you the ability to spin the needle this way. But like I said, this way absolutely works. If, if it works for you, that's great. You can do either way. I want to talk very briefly about how to know where your stitch is going to end up on the fabric. And I, I know that sounds strange, but this is something that really confused me at first because uh, didn't draw any dots. Okay, because it's obvious when you're making them all in a straight line like this, you you know that they're going to be all in the same place, you know, all lined up like that. But if you're, um, what confused me was the fact that because I am, I, what I have to tell myself that the stitch is going to sit on the fabric between these two dots. I come up at the top, down at the bottom. But what was confusing to me was the fact that because you're up here and then you're doing all this work up here, you know, all, I'm up on, you, especially if you, you know, move the needle like that, you're up here. And at first I was like, well, does that mean the stitch is going to sit on the fabric up there? You know, that's why I was confused. So I have to constantly remind myself that, and it does help if you can, uh, bend the needle back that way and lay the stitch down and say, okay, well that's where the stitch is going to be. And the reason, like I said, it's obvious when you're just doing stitches like this that are just, um, you know, in random space. But for instance, on this rose, it's much more confusing because you are, you know, you've got them all going in a spiral at different angles. So for instance, on a rose like that, you would perhaps, let me go over here, you would have something that looked like this. And that might be where your stitches are. That gets more confusing because you are going, to, let's say you're going to do this stitch right here, or let's do one right in, on the inside, right here. Let's call this the top, this the bottom. So you come up at the top, down at the bottom, come back out, and so, you know, obviously, three, four, let's do that, and it's probably going to take about four, let's just do that. Let's see if that one's fastened, I don't know if it's going to turn out nice or not. 
And then the next one is going to be from here to here. And so you do have to sort of keep track of where your stitches are going to, as I said, sit on the fabric. Let me go ahead and do the next stitch that you would probably do when making this rose. So it's going to be this one from here to here. The end of that stitch is right there. It's a little bit hard to see because it's sort of tucked under that first stitch. There's the top of my stitch. There's the bottom of the stitch. And as I showed you earlier, I'm going to want this one to be curved because I don't want it to sit. I don't want it to necessarily be straight. I want it to be curved. So I'll add more wraps to make it curved. Two, three, four, five, six. Maybe go one more. Seven. Well, let's just do eight. But here's where you can see that it gets uh, might get confusing about where your stitch is going to sit on on your pattern. Uh, you know, you've got all these lines going different directions. They're not all parallel. You know, you're working up here above the stitch, but the stitch is actually going to be down here. So what what it helps to remind myself is that the top of this, you know, the stitch is going to sit on the fabric between here and here, even though I'm wrapping it up here. So I wrapped it now. Ah, lost my needle. I can keep pulling it though. All right. Still can pull it. Tighten it up a little bit. I'm going to curve that way. I had to go put my thread back on my needle, but now I can take that thread down to the back. And now that one curves around there and it sits right there. And I would do the same thing if I was going to do a stitch that went from here to here. This would be the top. be the bottom of the stitch and then I'd come out here and then I would wrap my needle and go on my way. So that is just a little mini tutorial on how to do a bullion stitch rose but um, I think that covers just about everything you need to know to do some successful bullion stitches and I definitely want to encourage you please don't give up on bullion stitches. If you've tried them before and you've tried it a couple times and just said this is a complete failure, these are all a disaster, don't worry. We've all had disastrous bullion stitches, myself included. So keep practicing. They really are an, a neat addition to your repertoire of embroidery stitches. And so uh, hopefully you can learn to, if not maybe like them, maybe even love them. Now we are back here at our flower that needs those two bullion stitches. And so now that you've hopefully learned all you need to learn about bullion stitches and you've done some practice ones on a separate hoop, let's make these two, let's talk specifically about these two right here. First of all, I'm using six strands of Ecru DMC thread. And I have did not separate them, put them back together, and didn't strip them. I just cut them right off the skein just like this. I am most definitely using my milliner's needle that I talked about. That's the long needle. I think this is a number 18. I don't think I mentioned that in the in the video. But this is a number 18 milliner's needle where the shaft and the eye are the same width. So it'll just glide right through those wraps easily. All right. And we're going to put one stitch at an angle on this side and one stitch at an angle on this side. And I, for me, the way I work, my stitches ended up being nine wraps to take it from here and curve gently around and sort of tuck over on top of and sort of underneath this uh, French knot right here. All right, I don't really want necessarily a flat stitch right here. I do want it to curve a little bit. So I'm going to hold my breath, hopefully, and cross my fingers, you know, sort of me metaphorically, because I can't actually cross my fingers. I'm going to bring the needle up at, this is going to be the top of my stitch. This will be the bottom of my stitch. So I come up at the top, pull that thread all the way through, hold this thread to the side. I'm going to take the needle down at the bottom of my stitch, and I am tucking it a little bit under 
that French knot right there. So it looks like I'm just going to be obliterating everything right here, but once it curves, it will sort of it'll sort of hug the side. So I'm going to go all the way down, pull the needle through, but leave this loop of thread right here. Leave myself some working thread. And then I'm going to come up right where that thread can't, comes out of the fabric, right there. All right. I'm going to not pull the needle all the way through. And now I'm going to start my wrap. And I have determined that I want my wraps to go clockwise for this thread so that it will retain some of that twisted texture, just a little bit of that twisted texture. And I do find, as I mentioned in the video, I think that with DMC thread, it's a little bit easier to go clockwise instead of counterclockwise because it just holds the, the stitch together a little bit better. So anyway, I, I have determined that nine stitches, uh, no, I'm sorry, nine wraps works the best. So I'm going clockwise. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so I'm going to push those down. I can take that needle and lean it over like that and see if it's a little harder to determine on curved stitches if you have the right number of wraps, but that's why you practice first on something separate to make sure it looks the way you want it to look. So there's my nine wraps. I'm going to hold it gently with those two fingers. Pull that needle through. All right, here's the part that always trips me up. All right, so I've pulled it a little bit. I'm gonna use the end of my needle and pull or pull it around. All right, that one turned out pretty good. Now let's see if its size is about right. So if I sort of bend it around with my fingernail like that, looks like it's about right. So now I can take that needle down to the bottom of the stitch, just like that. And I think that's going to work pretty well. So you can see how it, like I said, it just hugs the side like that and it kind of, you know, nestles that French knot up in there like that. Now I'll do the same thing on the other side. Oh, and I did want to say that for this one, I, I want the wraps to be a little bit uh, dimensional. So I'm not wrapping super tight. I am letting them, I'm not, they're not loose, but they're not, you know, squeezing the needle so hard. In fact, I'm going to do something right now that is kind of a safeguard. I am going to flip this over, knot this thread, and snip it off so that this stitch is completely separate from the second stitch I make. Just in case this one turned out great, yay, good, that was good luck or something. If this one just goes all wonky and looks horrible and I need to snip it out, I don't want it to be attached to this one, which will just ruin this one. So I'm going, going to, like I said, flip this over, knot my thread, snip it off and then start completely over on this left side with a whole new stitch. I am ready to start my second stitch. I'm going to come up a little bit crowded up in there now, but I'm going to come up at the top. Go down just like I'm going to envision my curve going around. And so I'm going to go down just a little bit under that French knot. Leave my working thread, come back up at the top of the stitch, just like that. All right, leave the needle halfway. Nine wraps clockwise. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Gently pull those wraps down. Hold on to them. Hold my breath, say a prayer. All right. Ooh, gosh, that one turned two in a row. Yay. <laughs> Some kind of miracle. All right. So anyway, I can sort of curve that around. But anyway, push those wraps up so that they're sort of snugged up against there. And then I will take the needle down. Right, 
shape that one. Get it curved around. And yay! I can't believe both of them turned out great. That doesn't always happen. So I think I said this in the video too. If if the first one or the second one doesn't turn out great, that's okay. Just take it out. Separate the stitches so that they're not linked. So if you need to take out one but you want to leave a good one, just do that. But keep at it and don't be afraid of bullion stitches. They're really neat and it's just a really different effect. So I highly recommend practicing them enough to be able to use them in your stitching.